Last month, I saw this headline on the front page of the New York Times about using AI to improve the first image ever produced of a black hole. Being an AI researcher myself, that piqued my interest. So I emailed the lead author on that paper and all the papers leading up to it to talk about it. In this video, I'm gonna share what I learned and what the New York Times and other outlets got wrong. If you're new here, I'm an AI research scientist, currently in industry, formerly at Berkeley AI Research, one of the world's leading academic labs where I worked on robotics, computer vision, and reinforcement learning. So this video is gonna have three parts. First, how this black hole image was actually created and why making an image of a black hole isn't anything like taking a picture with your camera. Second, what the New York Times and other media outlets got wrong. And third, and most importantly, what we can learn from this image about black holes. Before I get into it, please subscribe if you haven't already to support this work. I know there are a lot of new people here and I wanna thank you all for joining me. I really appreciate the support. Hello? Oh, hi. Now, Leah Medeiros is an astrophysicist at the Institute for Advanced Study, where Einstein, Oppenheimer, and many other people worked, and where she studies computational approaches for understanding black holes. She was an author on the original paper publishing the first ever image of a black hole, and she's been working for many years with the Event Horizon Telescope, this network of telescopes spanning the globe, to publish many, many papers on black holes. The paper we're talking about today and its precursors are about a new algorithm called Primo. I'm sure you've done this a million times, but would you mind explaining at a high level what Primo is? Um, so what Primo does is we take the PCA, the two-dimensional PCA of tens of thousands of images, and what that does in practice is that it creates a basis for this hyperspace of images. Let me break that down. PCA stands for Principal Component Analysis, and it's a staple method in computer science. Basically, if you have a bunch of data, PCA finds a small set of points within the data that can be combined to create any other point in the data. So it finds a very small set of data points that describe all the rest of the data. A good way to think about this is in terms of primary colors. Do you remember being a kid and learning in art class that with just three colors of paint, red, yellow, and blue, you can mix those three paints to get any other color? Red plus blue makes purple, red plus yellow makes orange, blue plus yellow makes green. Those primary colors are the basis for all other colors, and they can be combined to create any other color in the spectrum. That's what PCA does. It finds the basis for any data set that you give it even if that data set is made up of things like images. What Primo does is it builds a data set of images of black holes from simulations. And as Leah points out, they're very careful to make that data set of images diverse. So diverse that it includes some black hole images that don't make theoretical sense. The reason they do this is so that we don't bias this method toward what we expect, so that we don't put our fingers on the scientific scale, so to speak. And then they use PCA on that data set to find the primary colors of black hole images. Once we have this basis for this hyperdimensional space of images, then we can use that basis to um, reconstruct any image that is in this space, right? And we just fit a linear combination of the PCA components directly to the data in 4A space. So to break that down, once we have the primary colors, red, yellow, and blue, if we have a particular color that we want to match, we use an iterative process to figure out how much red, yellow, and blue we need. You know, we start with red, we mix in a little bit of blue, oh now it's too blue, okay, so we mix in a little bit of yellow, now it's too yellow, so we put back a little bit of red, and now it's just right. And it's the same thing here. We have some raw data, some real observations from a specific black hole. And we have the primary colors of this black hole image data set from principal component analysis. So now we can just use an algorithm to tweak the ratios of those primary colors until the mixture we get matches our data more closely than any other mixture. Now, you might well ask, why do we have to do this at all? Like this guy in the comments of the New York Times story who said, how about publishing a picture of what's really there? Can you explain why creating an image of a black hole is like different from taking a photo with your camera or even looking through your telescope at home at the moon? We want to make an image of these black holes. We want to be able to resolve this little ring. If you actually do the math, you'll find that the size of the telescope you need is literally the size of the entire Earth. Okay, so we can't do that. So this idea of just taking a picture is just not something that humanity will ever realize in the sense of, you know, taking your phone and just like taking a picture. Since we cannot do that, and that's something that we will never be able to do, we need to use a technique called interferometry. What interferometry does is it does not take a actual picture. 
but it learns information about the picture and then we use that information that it learns to make our best guess of what that picture looks like. Our picture will continue to get better as we increase the number of telescopes because we will have more information about it. But fundamentally, we will never have all of the information about all of the details of the, of the image unless we can cover the entire Earth in telescopes. So instead of covering the Earth in telescopes, Leah and other researchers use the Event Horizon Telescope a collection of telescopes spread around the globe that collectively make up an Earth-sized telescope with a lot of blind spots. These are the locations of three of the telescopes that observed uh, the black hole in the center of our galaxy. Each pair of telescopes will observe one location in Fourier space, um, but what I think is really cool is that we actually use the Earth itself as part of our instrument, and as the Earth rotates, each pair of telescopes is in a slightly different location relative to the black hole in the sky. You can see that there's a lot of empty space. These are the empty spaces that I am concerned about. So using this new method allows us to fill in those blind spots in a way that is one, consistent with the data, and two, dead, dead simple. And that's really important. When this paper came out, the media had a field day reporting on the new black hole image created with AI, right in the middle of the chat GPT storm, a few months after the whole generative art moment. It is objectively a great time to have AI in a headline. But for reasons we'll explain, the AI used in this paper is nothing like ChatGPT or generative art systems. In fact, it's not really AI at all. So can we start with me explaining um, some, some things that I think have been not super accurate in the media? So when I first wrote the original algorithm paper that came out earlier this year, I didn't even have the words machine learning in the text, to be completely honest. I added a couple paragraphs, um, those that explanation in those paragraphs made it into the follow-up paper with the actual image and it made it into the press release. However, it's actually dictionary learning. It's not AI. It's very easy to understand. It's actually quite simple, I think. And I actually think that that's what makes this so powerful is that we don't need something like a real AI or a convolutional neural network. We're nothing like ChatGPT or anything like that, right? Principal component analysis is a super simple method. It's bread and butter. I learned it in my very first semester of college in a math class called linear algebra, not in a computer science class, not in an AI class. I didn't even get to AI until a year later. It's nothing like ChatGPT, and it's certainly nothing like AI art generators, which have billions of parameters and are trained on billions of images. This method has 20 parameters, and it's not even right to say it's trained. It doesn't learn anything. It's not inventing anything. It's not really trained at all. It just selects points from a dataset that summarize that dataset well. So when these articles come out saying, you know, astrophysicist creates black hole image using AI, around the same time they're publishing headlines that say things like, Midjourney releases art generated by AI, it makes the two sound equivalent. But in reality, this simple PCA approach and these giant AI models are about as different as this thing and this thing. Part of it is that the headline says AI in, you know, like big letters where like PCA, yeah. I mean, I would, I don't know, maybe I would call it AI. I would mostly call it linear algebra, you know? Yeah. Again, right. This is the first draft that I wrote. That's what I called it. And that's the other part that I, that I wish that, um, was better represented in the media in general is that like AI isn't magic. It's not machines actually thinking. Yeah. It's researchers getting very clever in how they use linear algebra. We're not creating things out of thin air. We're not, you know, creating hyper resolution. We're not doing any of that, but we do need to fill in the gaps. Like there's no way to move forward without filling in the gaps. So what is right to say about this black hole? What can we learn from this image? I'm going to let Leah explain because I am not an expert astrophysicist. Einstein's theory of gravity, general relativity, um, predicts that black holes in space should have a very specific shape. And when I say shape, I mean shape in 4D. So like the actual four dimensional geometry of them. If you were to find a black hole that is not consistent with that, it would mean that either one of those assumptions is not valid or that there's something fundamental wrong with our understanding of gravity itself. There, there's three things I want to talk about, about what the like take home messages from this image are. So the first thing I want to say is that the main thing we want is the ring diameter, actually. 
So when I say that we're measuring the ring size, the ring size allows us to test um, whether the geometry of the black hole is consistent with our expectations. Second is this ring width. The fact that we can actually get a good ring width is super exciting and super important for a variety of reasons. We know that the ring width can act effectively as an upper bound on our uncertainty. And so the fact that you can constrain the ring to be thinner is actually really exciting and really important. The third thing I would say is like a take home of why this is exciting is that the dark spot in the center of the ring is really important for us. If Einstein is right, we think that this is a black hole and this should have a, uh, it should have an event horizon and it should not have a normal surface. So if hypothetically this wasn't a black hole and it was some other weird object that we don't understand and it were to have a surface like a planet, for example, it might reflect some of the light that falls onto its surface. If it were to reflect light, the way that we would see that in our image would be that the dark spot at the center of the ring would be less dark. If you look at the original dark spot in the original image, it's really not that dark. But in the new image, it's a lot darker. So there you have it. This image helps us learn a lot about black holes, but there are still a lot of unknowns and a lot of things we don't want people leaping to conclusions about. You should not look at this image and say the dark spot is the event horizon. That is completely wrong. Mm. And that's in a lot of media. Hmm. Um, we cannot see the event horizon and proving whether or not this object has an event horizon is, is a really interesting and important question. And we can rule out some alternatives to an event horizon, but we still cannot conclusively prove that this image requires an event horizon. The event horizon is just not something you can see. Um, we can't use this data to prove that it even exists. To prove something is sometimes impossible right like people ask me like oh do all galaxies have black holes in their centers we think so we don't have an example that proves that it like we can't prove that a galaxy doesn't have a black hole but also you can't check every galaxy yeah <laughs> and there's galaxies where we can't tell yeah right and so it's not proven i think that you know our observations and our analysis of these observations have made the black hole hypothesis much, much, much more likely. Yeah. We're really ruling out a lot of different alternatives. We really do think that this is a black hole. To have something that's not a black hole, you need to create new physics that we don't understand. Right. Um, but again, you can't just point at the dark spot and say that's the event. That's yeah. just so in conclusion, yes, this is a super exciting, really cool result that improves our understanding of black holes and helps researchers like Leah be more certain that Einstein was correct. But no, it is not using AI in the way a lot of headlines suggest it is. I want to thank Leah Medeiros for being so generous with her time, and I'm looking forward to new and exciting results from her and her collaborators. Thank you all for watching, thank you all for being here. Please subscribe if you haven't already to support work like this. You can also subscribe to me on Substack where I write about AI, internet culture, and tech. Thanks so much.